Hi, everyone. If you would, if you are able, we would love to start with some movement. So if you can, please stand. And we're going to start with a prompt where I ask you to conduct an imaginary orchestra. So perhaps you are leading in the string section, followed by the wind instruments. And you are creating a symphony of beautiful sound. Excellent. Now change it up and conduct traffic at a busy intersection. Different quality of movement in your body. Notice how it feels differently, perhaps, than the orchestra. Now the fun part is let's do them both at the same time. Good. All right, rest your arms down at your side. <laughs> now, if you would, let's just isolate the head and neck. We're going to do a head and neck dance, waking up the muscles of the neck. The head and neck are the only part of the body where you can be expressive, so make good choices. And now, as you're moving your head and neck, start to take in the room. And though it's a little dark, start to say the things that you see as you see them. Stripes, chandelier, patriots, duct tape, wake forest T-shirt, light, exit sign, exit sign, windows, windows. X, red, black triangles, 100, glasses. Good, that's enough of that. <laughs> Excellent. Now everybody make with your body an angular shape. And now change it up. Make a circular shape. Go back to the angular shape. Find a different pathway to travel from this angular shape to your circular shape. Excellent. Congratulations. You all just did improvisational movement. <laughs> and now, let me ask you, do you think if you were to regularly practice improvisational movements like that, do you think that it could change your body or your mind? We do. We Christinas are a professor of dance and choreographer at Wake Forest University and a neuroscientist at the Wake Forest School of Medicine. Our work together is a shared inquiry into the artistic and scientific effects that you can see of improvisational movement on people's bodies and minds. So as a choreographer and a dance artist, I've become intrigued with and devoted to improvisational movement as a practice that can foster agency, especially for older adults, in a busy world that is full of change. Change is the only constant in our lives, so as we age, I believe we need to practice moving more than ever. Dancing with older adults has taught me that we need to constantly be practicing change, and the dance studio is a great place to do this. So today we want to talk about movement improvisation as a life skill, as well as improvisational movement as something we can do regularly in our lives. And in our case, it has been something that has inspired an unlikely partnership. What I'm going to show you now are some images from a community class that I've been teaching for six years here in Winston-Salem at the Academy of Dance Arts in Winston-Salem. And it is a class that we can offer free of charge, and the studio gives us the space for free. These participants, some are living with Parkinson's, some are caregivers, some are older adults who come to take the class. And they're waiting for me to share a series of rapidly delivered prompts much like the ones that you practiced. Um, so in these prompts, each, each prompt elicits a sea of spontaneous, different responses. Every movement is self-generated by the individual at the level and skill and ability in which they can respond. Every choice, therefore, is the right one. And we practice multitasking and problem solving in the dance studio in safe and effective ways. Later in class, we change the space up. This is intentional. We're trying to create an environment that is chaotic and disheveled, much like the world that we live and navigate through every day. So by doing this, we're practicing agency. 
we are in this moment doing a prompt called Walk Pause. And just like it sounds, the act is to walk in the space and pause in the space on your own, with your own agency, and with your own moment of this is mine. So I've been really fortunate because in addition to this community class, I've been able to be a part of several different pilot studies that study in a scientific way what is it that's happening when an improvisational dance intervention happens in a different community. So one of our studies with the Translational Science Center here at Wake looked at people living with Parkinson's and their caregivers. And on the left, you see a participant who's tasked before the study began with this, the um, ability to just stand out of a chair and raise her arms. And on the right, you see her uh, practicing this act after seven weeks of improvisational movement together. You can see it's pretty profound, the difference in getting in and out of the chair, something that so many of us probably take for granted. This participant, um, also in the same study, living with Parkinson's, the task before and after the study show significant change as well. Crossing the midline of the body, again, an easy skill perhaps, but one that becomes more complicated as we age. And you see that the range of motion in this action has, has increased, as well as the fluidity that she's able to do it. I also love her ability to take her head with her on the action. She's falling off of her axis. She doesn't need to see where she's going. She is physically confident in that moment. That, to me, is so inspiring. So these videos are really what started our collaboration together. I saw them at a presentation sponsored by the Wake Forest Translational Science Center. As a neuroscientist, they really caught my attention. So part of my work looks at how things like aerobic exercise that you might normally do affects the brain in older adults. But what Christina was doing was totally different. Nobody's walking on a treadmill. There are no repetitive mov movements. In fact, it's deliberately non-repetitive. And yet people are getting real benefits in standing, walking, and balancing. On top of that, um, on top of that, what she's doing is in people with active neurodegeneration, right? So they're going through this process and they're still having these benefits. And not only that, but she's not even giving them feedback on their movements. So they're doing all these different things. She's not telling them if it's correct or not, and yet they're still getting benefit. So it seemed to me that this is thinking about moving in a very different way than I was used to thinking about it. And it was interesting to me to think about how that might be changing people's brains. Also, as a human, I could see that Christina was changing people. As a neuroscientist, I believe that if we can see that change, we can measure it. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about our scientific work together, which really is just beginning. So Christina mentioned to you that the videos that you saw before were part of a pilot research study that she did with Dr. Glenna Batson at Winston-Salem State University and people with Parkinson disease. So we've now taken this work and translated it into a community of people with early stage memory loss. That may not seem intuitive to you, but you may not know that the same neural pathology that affects memory can also affect people's mood and balance and gait and that are taken care of in other regions of their brain as well. So we really thought that what Christina was doing might help ameliorate some of these secondary symptoms of memory loss. Um, in addition, we think that improvisation might be a uniquely good fit for people with memory loss because, as you saw, it doesn't necessarily re rely so much on memory. So, you know, maybe you don't remember how to get from your angular shape back into your circular shape, right? But it's okay, because you're going to move right on to the next prompt, and every choice you make is the right choice. So there's no judgment. There are no wrong choices. And some of these core principles of improvisation, like having no judgment, are really important when you're undergoing a neurodegenerative process that's out of your control. I also think it's really important in Christina's work that she includes caregivers and care partners. So the process of memory loss or really any neurodegenerative disease can be very dehumanizing. But this class and improvisational movement creates a really democratic playing field for people coming in. And now I'm going to walk you through some of our ideas about how improvisational movement may be changing people's bodies and minds when they're undergoing early stages of memory loss. And I'm going to do it using a diagram that uses data from our pilot study. So Christina's class obviously has a movement component, and you all participated in part of that. And what we saw in our pilot was that that movement resulted in improved balance. 
and the improved balance went along with increased connectivity in somatomotor brain regions that are important for movement, and we were able to measure that. Christina's class is also highly social, and you all kind of experienced that as well. There was a lot of giggling. There was a lot of looks of disbelief. There was a lot of looking at your neighbor, like, are we really doing this? <laughs> um, and that social engagement is really powerful. And in fact, the largest, the largest support group for Parkinson disease in our community came out of Christina's class because of this deep social engagement that arises. In our pilot study, we saw that people's symptoms of depression and mood improved and their apathy decreased. And this went along with increased connectivity and brain networks that are important for social engagement. Another piece of data that I don't have illustrated for you that, but we thought was intriguing was that when we asked people in com Christina's community class about different things that were changing, one unexpected thing they reported was 100% of them said that their empathy for other people increased. And so because of this, in the pilot study, we included a mindfulness questionnaire, and that was one of the most reliable increases we saw before and after her intervention. So we feel that all these changes combined come together to improve quality of life, both for the person experiencing mem memory loss and their care partner. There are a couple other important points that I want to mention. One is that we're not suggesting that this intervention is curing disease, right? You still have Parkinson's disease, you still have memory loss, and those diseases are going to continue to progress. But this may be a really important way, engaging in an arts practice may be a really important way to help you live with those diseases and live with the experiences that you're having. Another quick point I'd like to make is that it is very tempting when you see beautiful brain images like this to get caught up in the idea of this is the brain, part of the brain that's changing with improvisation or the part of the brain that's improving. But what I really want you to walk away with is that these brain images are one lens through which you can see the benefits of an arts practice incorporated in regularly into your life. So as a choreographer and teacher, Working with older adults in the dance studio is similar to the ways that I work with my undergraduate students. The same guiding principles of trying to instill a regular arts practice in your life are there. And while I'm grateful that the class has yielded some therapeutic benefits, I'm not calling what I do dance therapy. So what is it then? What are we practicing in the dance studio? I think we're practicing how to be human beings. Movement is a human condition. It is both an art and a science, and this should fascinate all of us. So, ultimately, I have a deep appreciation now for art and science together, and in our case, dance and neuroscience. Most importantly, though, I think the message is about unlikely partnerships and that we need to make space and room for them in our lives. So throughout our process together of writing grants, publishing in journals, going to arts and science conferences together, I'm grateful for the way a neuroscientist has taught me so much about art. And I'm grateful for the ways that Christi my experiences with Christina have informed my life, both personally and professionally. So on a personal note, our families, one of our family's New Year's resolutions last year was to attend a live performance every month, and I'm proud to say that we did it. And I would say in the work sphere, one of the most important things that I continue to learn from our collaboration is that it's important as a scientist to try to measure the unmeasurable and not be afraid of that. So when I think about the work that I've had over the past three years, and I think about how different it would be if I had been unwilling to have this conversation with Christina because how in the world are you going to make a scientific protocol out of improvisational movement? Or even if you did, who's going to fund you to do that work? But just the willingness to be in that space and have that conversation and try to measure something which I would still say is unmeasurable has really pushed our work and our thinking and our understanding forward. So we often think and reference MacArthur Award-winning genius choreographer Liz Lerman in our work. She's written a really wonderful book called Hiking the Horizontal, where she challenges us to look at the hierarchies that we create within the systems that we operate in. We tend to privilege one over another. So for instance, you might be sitting here thinking that the science is more important in this conversation. Or maybe you're thinking, no, it's about the art. Well, for us, these things have to live on a horizontal playing field, and we treat them as equal players. Or perhaps you're looking at us as professors or as idealistic scholars, and that this work exists separate from the community. But again, we work together and work horizontally, hiking this terrain together. 
So this willingness that we've had to meet each other, hiking a horizontal, has changed the landscape of our work. It's opened new paths to engage more deeply in our separate work and also extend our shared work. So I'm delighted that we're working towards trademarking the name Improvement as an improvisational movement curriculum that can be further disseminated and developed. And we have a website for that. As I've already mentioned, we've completed a couple of different pilot studies funded through the Translational Science Center and through the Blue Cross Blue Shield Wellness Initiative here at Wake Forest. And we're currently recruiting the first wave of participants for our randomized controlled trial funded by the NIH to test Christina's method. As a choreographer, we work now intergenerationally. I am delighted to bring dancers as young as age five or as young as age 86 into the studio together, where collaboratively dance making takes place. Our scientific team has started working with senior services in our community to look at investigating a beautiful program that's going on at the Tab Williams Adult Day Center of intergenerational kinder music. Or also with senior services, we're working on an app so that our most vulnerable homebound older adults can have access to movement like this. And a certified nursing assistant or another home health aid professional can be with them in their living room or in their kitchen going through these kinds of prompts together. Also, May 3rd and 4th this year will be the third time that Wake Forest co-sponsors the Aging, Re Aging Reimagine Symposium. So this is a multidisciplinary aging symposium where we bring in thought leaders, international thought leaders in the world of aging from many different disciplines. And we co-organized this with our colleague Danny Kim Shapiro. And what really got this started was the wonderful interactions that we've had and the way that this shared understanding has pushed our work. We wanted that to be available to our colleagues and to the community. So this is an event that people in the community also can attend. Similarly, people in the county can take lifelong learning classes at Wake Forest University, including our improvement classes. All of this, and we know there's so much more ahead of us that is yet unknown. So science and art may seem disparate, but making space for unlikely partnerships has helped us see commonality. We are both engaged in rigorous modes of inquiry and we are informed by each other's understandings. So one of my favorite examples of this is falling. This is how we see falling in geriatric medicine. It's a vulnerable older adult, it's a dangerous situation, and in fact we define falling very clinically. It's defined as coming to rest unintentionally on the ground or a lower surface. And in dance, that's not at all how we see falling. Um, we think falling is beautiful. It's something we practice. It's a choreographic choice. It's a skill. Falling is walking. Falling is shifting your weight. It has meaning. It's beautiful. I love hearing Christina talk about falling as redefining your relationship with the ground. <laughs> yes. So she tells students in her community class that falling is going to happen, but What's more important than that is can you become comfortable on the ground? Maybe you can even be th think, begin thinking of new ways to get back on your feet. But improvisation can help us to see that there can be a multiplicity of responses and not one single predetermined outcome. So what if we were to, this were advice that we all took? What if we said it's time for us all to begin redefining our relationship with the ground? <laughs> 